you're here. What's up, Rocky? How are we today? Hey, I'm so glad that you're here. Why don't you stand up with us? We're going to worship Jesus with all we got. Here we go. Lord is my 
Amen. Isn't that good? Man, it's good to be together. It's good to worship together. My name's Dane. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And I'm pumped to keep singing, to keep worshiping. This next song, we have a baptism that we get to celebrate that happened in our first service. Our friend who trusts in Jesus with all his heart chose to follow him and demonstrate that in front of the entire church. And so we get to celebrate that. We also get to remember what that means to put our trust in Jesus. And so all of us in this room, as we sing, I want to encourage you to bring what you have and give it to Jesus today. Let's sing this out. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior.
so good. Such a good reminder. You know, about a week ago, we were in Kenya at a pastor's conference, and Dane was actually leading worship, and we were singing this chorus, just holy, holy, holy are you, Lord, because really that's the only thing that we could all sing together, and it's such an amazing thing. You take, a, take away that we don't speak the same language, but when you sing holy, holy, holy are you, Lord, together, there's just something amazing that happens, and I love being here this morning worshiping together and being able to do that. So excited to be here. You guys can take a seat, grab your communion that you got on your way in. If you're joining us online today, glad you're hanging out with us. So a team of us um, did head to Kenya about six days ago, and we did several different things. We were in three different parts of Kenya. We did a pastor's conference, hung out at both of our schools in Medoya and Lochardome, and we had an awesome, awesome trip. But you know, we've been in this series, everyone has a story worth telling. And if you know me, you know one of my favorite things to do is to ask people, what's your story? I do it everywhere I travel, love just hearing what what God's done in people's lives. Who are they? What's their journey that got them where they are? And so I love being in Kenya because there's just all day, every day, you feel like you can just be like, what's your story? And so we, we actually headed out to Turkana, which is a couple hours from Nairobi by plane, and then another couple hours driving out into the middle of nowhere. I mean, when I say the middle of nowhere, there is nothing around. And we drove out there, and I'm meeting our little sponsored girl for the first time. Her name's Rosella. Um, she's about six years old. And we're sitting in a manata, which is like a hut with her and her mom. And we sit down to have a conversation. And I'm doing that, like, what's your story? How long have you been here? Tell me about yourself. And as we're sitting there having this conversation, you can look at it and think, we are so different. There's nothing that connects us, right? Different social status, completely different stories on how we grew up, where we came from, our skin color is different. There's nothing the same. But to be honest with you, when you break it all down, we're really not that different. Because when you're sitting across from this person, there's one story that just breaks down all of those other things, and it's the story of Jesus, right? And his, his truth, that God loved us and her and you, no matter where we're from, where we sit, how we show up in this place, so much that he sent his son to go to the cross for us, and we get to celebrate that together. So that's what we get to do every Sunday. We all come from a different different place. We all got here in a different way. We have different opinions, but we're still united because of that. So that's what I want us to remember today. You can take out that cup. It has some bread, some juice in it. It represents his body, his blood, his sacrifice for us. And I want you to take that. Just get in front of Jesus today. Maybe say those words over and over in your head. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Give him praise today for who he is, for what he did for us. Go ahead and take the bread and the juice when you're ready. thankful for today, thankful that we can come together, we can worship together, God, that we can be reminded that we all have a story, we have a story worth telling, God, and that may look different for every single one of us, whether we're here in in Frederick and Firestone and wherever we're watching online, God, or halfway across the world in Africa, God, that you have something amazing to do through our story. 
God, at the end of the day, the, the greatest story is that you loved us so much that you sent your son to go to the cross for us. So God, thankful that we can celebrate that together today. God, I pray for us as we hear your word today, God, that we just wouldn't take these words and, and not do anything with them, but God, let us be a church that takes the words we hear today, God, and we, we live those out. We're thankful. We're thankful for who you are, God. We trust you. We love you. And we give you praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, what up, Rocky? Hey, I'm so glad you came to church this morning. However, I did not. I'm actually away celebrating 20 years of marriage with my wife, Vanessa. But next week, I'll be back as we begin a brand new series talking about donkeys and elephants. You heard that right, and it's going to be a good one, and I hope you'll be there. But today, we're going to be finishing up our series entitled, Everyone Has a Story Worth Telling. And I've invited my friend, Ben Foote, to come and close out the series. And Ben, he's he's got a past of ministry. He's been a pastor, and he's a great communicator. I got to know him over the last couple of years as he actually just lives a couple houses down from me. And I know he's going to do a great job, and he'll be a blessing for you this morning. So both campuses, will you do me a favor and welcome? Ben Foote. Thank you. Hi. And like Matt said, my name is, is Ben Foote. Um, I'm very, very pumped to be here with you this morning. Uh, what I used to do for like 12 years of my life, I was a pastor over at Flatirons Community Church in Lafayette. Uh, for the last year and a half, though, I've been doing something different with my life. I travel a lot now. And so when Matt asked if I would be available to teach this weekend, that was really exciting because I live like right down the street, right? Like I, I'm right over here. I can take a baseball from this auditorium and throw it and hit my house, you know? My arm's not what it used to be, so I'd have to throw it and then go get it and throw it again like 30 times. But the, po- the point is that I'm close. Um, and in this new phase where I travel a lot, like it feels special, at least just to me, to get to teach like at home. You know, where it's like we might not know each other personally yet, but we share a community and we share neighborhoods. And it's like we are the people of Firestone and Frederick and Decono and and Niwot, right? Like you're like me. You can grill a burger in 70 mile per hour winds, you know? (laughs) You know how to play whack-a-mole with prairie dogs. Like you're just like me. So, um, but also I just really think that you have a super special thing going on at Rocky Mountain. And so I won't ramble. I just want you to hear right off the bat. Genuinely, I'm very honored to get to spend some time with you this morning. Thanks for having me. I'll be wandering around the Frederick campus after this. So come say hi. I'd love to meet you. Okay. Enough of that. Let's jump in. All right, so you are wrapping up your series called Everyone Has a Story Worth Telling. The series is exactly what it sounds like. It's about the fact that you have a story worth telling. Even if you don't think you do, you do, right? You have a story worth telling. And stories are are powerful things. We already know this, right? A story has the power to connect with others and connect people to each other. It has the power to inspire change and offer hope. That's just story alone. But then when Jesus gets a hold of your story, then now your story has the power to be like a light in a dark, dark world. Like don't hide your story under a bushel. No, you've got to let it shine, right? And so we all have a story, right? And we all have a story that needs to be told. And yet at the same time, My guess is that many of us, maybe even most of us, you're sitting here and in your head you're going, yeah, that's probably true for a lot of people in this room, but it's not true for me. Not true for me because I don't even know what my story would be, or my story's too messy, my story's too shameful to share, or my story's not over yet. Like, whatever the reason, we're hesitant to share our stories. And here's one of the main reasons I believe that we're hesitant to share our stories. I think it's because we've convinced ourselves that there should be a bow at the end of a story, right? It needs to have a happy ending, right? I think we've convinced ourselves that like all good stories start with once upon a time and all good stories end with, and then they lived happily ever after. But then we look at our own lives and we look at our own stories and we don't see any bows at the end of anything, right? We don't see any happily ever after. In fact, most days we just kind of feel like train wrecks, right? Or we don't feel like very good protagonists in our own story because we, we just can't seem to learn our lesson ever, right? It's like we're making the same mistakes over and over again. We're, stu- we're stuck in the same patterns and habits. And so we end up convincing ourselves that probably our stories need to wrap up first. Like probably we need to be fixed before we have a story to share. 
And what happens is, the result is that your journey with Jesus becomes an intensely personal, almost secretive thing, and your story just never gets told. And so today, I want to talk specifically to anyone in the room who thinks that you feel like you don't have a story to share until you get fixed. Okay, and to do that, I want to tell you about the lives of two very different people. Okay, both of these men are total messes, all right? But at the same time, I'm pretty sure that their messes are the stories that they have to share with the world. One of these guys is named Paul, the Apostle Paul from the New Testament. The other dude is just me, okay? So I'll go first. Um, (laughs) So I grew up in Dallas, Texas, okay? I grew up in a church-going family. That's not everyone's story, but that was mine. Uh, We went to a tiny little church, maybe like 150 people on the biggest Easter or something like that. So you kind of knew everyone in the church, and my dad was really involved. He was an elder at one one point, and so what that meant for me as a kid is like I was inside that church building all of the time, right? It's like Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evenings, those are all guarantees, and then I'm also there for all the other stuff, and dad would take me to meetings where I would just like roam around the building and try to snack on communion and break into the baptism pool and all that stuff, and it was fun when I was a little kid, but then I started to grow up, and my eyes started to open to the community that I was a part of, and not in a good way, okay? And I I really, truly hope that you've never had this experience, but I know that a lot of us have, for, for me, I was probably around 13 would be the first time I remember thinking to myself in my head, all these church people seem pretty fake. Okay, that was, and I, it's a blanket statement. I know that. I've grown up. I've matured. Looking back on it now, I know that there were plenty of fantastic people in my church, but that's how it felt at 13, right? All these church people are fake. And I was grossed out by what seemed to be an obvious lack of honesty and vulnerability. Because I knew all these people, right? I I knew them through Monday through Saturday. I knew that like Monday through Saturday, some of these people, their marriages are falling apart and their kids are train wrecks and they're drinking a little too much and they can't hold a steady job. Like I knew that about these people. And to be clear, like please hear me, people being broken didn't bother me. What bothered me was those same broken people pretending to be perfect for an hour on Sunday morning. It just didn't make any sense to me. It's like suddenly on Sunday morning, everyone's got their shirts tucked in and everyone's like cleanly shaven and they're calling each other brother and sister and talking about how perfect their life is thanks to Jesus. And then ultimately I started to wonder like maybe they expect the same thing from me. Maybe they're expecting me to be like perfect and flawless, and, or at least maybe they're expecting me to pretend like it. And I just don't really have an interest in pretending to be something I'm not, and so I just never really felt like I was enough. Okay, I never felt good enough or perfect enough or holy enough to like truly fit in with other people who were Christians. And then eventually I made a really dangerous connection in my brain. What I told myself was, Okay, well, if that's how Christians act, that must be because that's how Jesus acts. And if that's how Jesus acts, then I don't want anything to do with him. And in high school, I slowly started to just kind of back away and bail from all things faith and all things Jesus. And the main reason I was bailing was because I knew myself and I know that I can't be perfect, right? That was high school. But really the the final nail in the coffin of my faith came in my freshman year of college. It was just a phase of life where I was putting these puzzle pieces together and I noticed a trend of deep sadness in my life for like as long as I could remember. And I just, I woke up one morning in my dorm room and felt like I had this sudden realization. It was like, oh, I have depression. Like that's that's what's going on with me. And at the time, life was great. Okay, I I finally lived a thousand miles away from my home. I loved college. I loved the friends I was making. I had met Allie, who I was quickly falling in love with. I would eventually marry her. It's like life was good, but I had noticed this trend in my life that even when life is good, there's still always this dark, heavy burden on my shoulders all of the time. If you have depression, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the the reason that depression felt like the final nail in the coffin of my faith was because in my church, like in the Christian context that I was aware of, that I knew about, it's like you cannot be a Christian with depression. Depression is a sin, right? Depression is a lack 
of faith. Depression means that you don't actually trust Jesus and maybe Jesus doesn't actually love you enough to make you happy. Depression and faith were like completely incompatible in the faith context that I grew up in. It's like if you were depressed, people started talking about you behind their, your back. Like they're gonna try and scheme ways to save you. I said, maybe he just needs rebaptized, or maybe he needs an exorcism. Like, who, who knows any Catholics, right? Someone call the Catholics. And so in college, I just, I realized, oh, I have depression. And what I told myself right away, I was like, well, that's that, right? Any thin thread that was still connecting me to the hope that maybe that faith could one day be my own, it's like, well, that's gone now. Because I thought that it's just not possible to be a Christian with depression. And if you have depression, you know that thing tends to linger. Right? There's not really a bow at the end of that story. So over the, the next several years, my depression grew and grew. My hopelessness grew with it. I was on a very dark path. Looking back now, I can tell you I'm not even sure I would have survived the path that I was walking down if I didn't meet the real Jesus. Okay, the real one. Not, not the mean, judgmental version of headmaster Jesus that I grew up with, but the real Jesus. The Jesus that I eventually learned could love and work through train wrecks. He could even love and work through a train wreck like a guy named Paul. Okay, we'll come back to my story. Let's talk about Paul now. If you're new to faith uh, and not very familiar with your Bible yet, that's fine. Um, you probably don't know, though, that Paul's got, like, a crazy story. He's got a very incredible story. Okay, the first time that you, you meet Paul, it's in the book of Acts. His name is still Saul. He eventually changes his name. But you meet him in this moment where one of the very first Christians, a guy named Stephen, is being stoned to death. Okay? In Colorado, I always feel like I need to clarify, that means people were throwing rocks at him. <laughs> okay? He wasn't getting stoned to death. He was being stoned to death. Anyway, this poor dude, Stephen, okay, he's being murdered. And Paul's there, and Paul's actually, like, overseeing the murder. Okay, look at this. It says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep, a.k.a. he died. And then Saul, that's Paul, was there, giving approval to his death. Okay, before meeting Jesus, Paul is a, is a bad dude. Okay, he was a very radicalized young Jewish man. He thought that the best way to protect the Judaism that he loved so much was to squash this new Christian movement that cropped up. Paul knew that you gotta break a couple eggs to make an omelet, and Stephen was just one of the eggs. Right, he, was a bad, he was a bad dude. But then eventually, Paul has this miraculous encounter with Jesus. He's struck blind. He has a confrontation with Jesus where he's met with nothing but grace. Eventually, the scales fall from Paul's eyes, literally and figuratively. And then he, he, Paul eventually becomes like the most influential Christian missionary to have ever lived, hands down. And he writes the majority of the New Testament. And you hear that and you're like, what a story. Right? It's a very incredible story. In fact, if, if you've been a Christian for a while, when you heard that I want to talk about Paul's story, that's probably the story that you were picturing, right? It's the story where Paul goes from murderer to blind to influential Jesus follower. But today, that's actually not the part of Paul's story that I want to talk about. Instead, I want to talk about the story of what Paul's life looked like after he started following Jesus, Okay, this is a story that we can piece together through the letters that he wrote his friends that are, are still uh, preserved in our New Testaments. And it's a story that is not a happily ever after story, not at all. It's, it's not a sanitized story about a man who met Jesus and then he was miraculously healed of all sin and struggle and doubt and darkness. That's not Paul's story. Instead, Paul's story sounds way more like our real lives. It's a story about a man who met Jesus and then he stayed a mess. It's just that now he was a mess who was loved and forgiven and leveraged by Jesus. When, when Paul wrote letters to his friends, he didn't tell the story about being struck blind over and over and over again. He didn't. Instead, he told the story of how he's a mess now, but Jesus still loves him. Like, apparently, according to Paul, he realized that Jesus' grace in the midst of his brokenness was the number one story that he had to share with the world. 
And you see this all throughout Paul's letters. If I were to give you every single example of this, we would be here absolutely for just like hours and hours and hours. So instead, I'll give you my two favorite examples from Paul's letters of the story of what Paul's life looked like after he started following Jesus. Okay, the first one's in Romans 7. Comes right out the gate and he says, nothing good lives in me. I know that. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature because I have the desire to do what is good, but it's like I just, I cannot carry it out. And like what I do is not the good that I want to do. Instead, the evil stuff that I do not want to do, this is what I keep on doing. And then Paul says, so I find this law at work in my life. Like whenever I want to do good, it's like evil is right there with me. Now, doesn't that immediately sound more like your real life? More than the story of, once I met Jesus, my greatest sin is that I work too hard for him. I pray too much. Doesn't that sound more like real life? It's like, I, I, I know I'm not the only one in this room who hears Paul's words from Romans 7 and feels relieved. It's like, finally, someone gets me. Right? Some of the, this might be new to some of you. Right? Some of you might even be going like, wait, so wait a minute, Paul is saying that I can be a Christian? I can even be like a Paul-level Christian and have that daily struggle of good and evil in my heart? Wait, are you saying I can even lose that struggle most days like Paul said he did and still be a Christian? It's like, guys, yeah, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is not that you need to be perfect on your own power. The gospel is that you need to be forgiven by somebody else's power, and you have been. The gospel is that Jesus loves you the same way he loved Paul, which is to say he loves you in the midst of your mess and your brokenness. The gospel is not a story that goes like this. I met Jesus, and then my whole life after that became spiffy, clean, and perfect. It's not the story. The gospel is a story that goes like this. I am a mess, but I have met the one who is not. His name is Jesus. I don't know how he's gonna do it, but I do believe that he will finish a good work that he started in me. That's the gospel. And I I love Paul so much because he got this. He was 100% unafraid to be 100% honest and vulnerable about his own brokenness. And something in our guts, I would say in our souls, resonates with the kind of honesty that we see in Paul. Maybe you even have an inexplicable feeling of like joy and happiness right now. I believe that's because our souls are tuned to respond to the real gospel. Something in us knows that Paul's honesty and vulnerability is a better way to live our lives. I mean, I'll I'll just bring this down to like a real life example. Something in us knows that our small groups could become literal lifesavers if we could only learn to be open and honest about our brokenness like Paul was. We know that. Like if I could just go, if you could just go to small group this week and you you go, you hang out and you make your small talk and you eat dinner and then you sit down on the couch, it's time to do the real part of it or whatever. And if you could just raise your hand and basically quote Romans 7 and go, hey, so update from the Foot family this week, I did nothing good, right? In fact, all the, all the evil stuff, I, all the stuff I don't want to do because it brings me shame and it brings me guilt, for some reason I did all that stuff this week. I don't know why I did it. I think it's because every time I want to do something good, it's like there's this evil lurking in the corners of my heart. Something in us knows that if we could just be that honest about our brokenness, it wouldn't lead to shame. It would lead to freedom. We know that. Our souls are resonating with that. Paul knew that Jesus wasn't asking him to get perfect. He was asking Paul to get real, get honest, get vulnerable. And all throughout Paul's letters, Paul just gets real. He's, go read these things. He's so open and honest about his own brokenness and his own suffering, about the struggles that persist well into a mature relationship with Jesus. Like, that's what we just saw in Romans 7. Now I want to give you the second example. It's actually my, personally my favorite example of this. Uh, it, it's in 2 Corinthians. If Romans 7 that we just read is a great example of Paul's honesty, then 2 Corinthians is a great example of Paul's vulnerability. Okay, 2 Corinthians is a letter that Paul writes to his friends living in Corinth. As usual, he writes just a beautiful letter. 
Okay, the, the first part is all about how God loves us and he'll keep his promises and we're forgiven and we can have hope in the midst of hardship, like all these really beautiful things about Jesus. And then in chapter 12, Paul changes his tone pretty drastically. And this is where we're gonna pick up now. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse seven. Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. All right? In this verse, it almost feels to me like Paul is kind of leaning in and he's whispering right now, like he's sharing a secret with you. It's like for the first 11 chapters, he's been like, Jesus is so awesome and here's all the things that he accomplished for you. And then in chapter 12, it feels like he's leaning in going like, hey, can I just be real with you guys for a minute? Because I've got this thing in my life that's intense and I'm suffering and it's killing me. And then in the next verse, Paul gets so, so vulnerable. Look at this. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. All right, so Paul's got this thorn in his flesh. It's a metaphor, of course. It's not an actual thorn. He's got something in his life that's bringing him suffering, causing him pain. And then he confides in his friends. He's brave enough to tell them, like, I've even been begging God to take this thing away from me. Paul says that. Paul, like the absolute stallion of a missionary and Christian and leader, like Paul has something so dark and so heavy and so painful in his life that he's begging God for relief. This is where we gotta pause and remember like, what's the point of going to church if we're not being honest with ourselves? We gotta make sure we connect with this part of scripture. You've got to ask yourself, have you ever been there? Have you ever begged and pleaded with God to take something away from you? Have you begged him for healing and begged him for relief? Of course you have. We all have. If you're anything like me, you didn't pray that prayer three times, you've prayed that prayer 3,000 times, right? Like, so what I want you to do right now is think of it though. What is that thing for you? What is the thorn in, in your life right now? It might be like my story. Maybe it's depression or anxiety or Maybe it's the thing from your past that haunts you. It's the thing that you did or the thing that was done to you or it's the addiction you can't break. It's the, the baggage because your family just seems like it's a total mess. It's the crippling insecurity. I don't know what it is for you, but what is it? Think of it. What is your thorn? Your thorn is the thing that you've convinced yourself disqualifies you from being a good dad, good mom, good spouse, good kid, good friend, good leader. And your thorn is the thing that you've convinced disqualifies yourself from having a story worth telling. All right, so think about yours right now, your thorn. What have you begged and pleaded for God to erase from your life? And now with that in mind, let's look at the next verse. This is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. This is a verse that changed my life. It's turned my whole worldview upside down. It played a key role in leading me back to Jesus. And in this next verse, Jesus himself responds to Paul's begging and Paul's pleading. And we know what we want Jesus to say to Paul. We know. We want him to say, yes, yes, of course, Paul. Right, I'll take your thorn away from you. You've been such a faithful servant. You've earned this. You've deserved this. Like, that's what we want Jesus to say to Paul. What does he say instead? Paul says, but he, Jesus, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We, we want, we don't like what he just said. We want Jesus to say, yes, Paul, absolutely. I can do all things, and so I can certainly take this thorn away from you, and I will. What does he say instead? I mean, Paul is begging and pleading for Jesus to remove suffering from his life, and Jesus replies by saying, no. No, no but. No, but my grace is sufficient for you, which means I'm not gonna take it away, but I'm also not gonna let it crush you. He goes, and actually, Paul, like my power is going to be made perfect through your thorn. And then because Paul is a man who truly understood the gospel, he truly understand that, understood that Jesus glorifies himself through our weaknesses way more often than through our strengths, Paul responds by saying this. He goes, therefore, based on what Jesus told me, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
And this is why, for Christ's sake, I actually delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties because in the totally upside-down kingdom of God, when I am weak, that's when I am strong. To return to my story, okay, I, I used to believe that Jesus expected perfection out of me. And so faith was like, in my, this, the distorted faith in my life was like a shame-based thing and it was a fear-based thing. I was absolutely convinced that Jesus was constantly disappointed in me, constantly disgusted with me, disgusted with my past and my baggage and my weakness and my suffering. Like, I didn't grow up believing that Jesus' grace was sufficient for me. I grew up believing that Jesus' grace would be taken from me unless I could prove myself sufficient and then I met the real Jesus. And this happened later in life. Allie and I, we, we got married and we moved to Colorado and I was working in a magazine. I was in the publishing world at the time. I hated it and I didn't know what to do with my life and I was lost and aimless and confused. My depression had become like absolutely o- overbearing and unbearable. It was terrible. And, and in that season of life, Allie wanted to start going to church and I was like, what the heck? I'll start going with you. We started going to this church and I started to meet these pastors who were broken but they would just admit that they were broken. And then I started to meet people who went to that church who were totally honest that Jesus had a ton of work to do in their lives, but but they were committed to Jesus doing the work. It's like, basically, I found a community of people who knew, like Paul knew, that the story of Jesus' grace is a story that can only be told through your brokenness. And it was so refreshing, and it was so exciting, and it was so contagious. And so I start reading my Bible again for the first time in a really long time. And I'm reading it through a whole new lens and a whole new light. And 2 Corinthians 12, 9 just jumps off the page of me. It's like, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And for the first time in my life, I realized that when Jesus looks at my, my baggage and my brokenness, and my suffering, and my hardship. Like when Jesus looks at my depression, he doesn't say, get your act together. Instead, he says, I can work with that, and so give it to me. It's like once that clicked, all these other beautiful things about Jesus started to click for me. It's like I started to truly realize that he didn't expect me to be perfect, which is why he was perfect for me on my behalf. I started to realize he's not asking me to earn his grace. He's telling me to just like fall into it, to receive it. I started to realize that God sent his son to this world, not because he wanted to send me on an existential lifelong guilt trip and not because he wanted to put me through a spiritual pass or fail exam, right? Like, oh, you cussed today, so now you're going to hell. You better pray. Right? I realized, oh, that's not the case. He actually sent Jesus to this earth because of his great love for me, of all people. And I realized, like, dang, he did that so that I could be forgiven and I could be redeemed and I could be restored into a relationship with Jesus. And I started to realize that, like, a massive part of my relationship with Jesus is Jesus looking at my brokenness and saying, give that to me because I can work with that. And so slowly but surely, because old habits die really hard, but slowly I started to be honest and vulnerable about my brokenness with Jesus, and then the scarier part, of course, is with other people. But then every time I was honest and vulnerable, it's like I found freedom instead of shame. It's like not what I was expecting to find. And then, so then eventually I handed Jesus my depression, and I was like, can you even work with darkness like that? And his answer was, of, like, of course I can. Actually, like, my power is made perfect through stuff like that. And this is where I have to be clear with you, okay? Because, again, most churches, most Christians, especially the people who do what I'm doing right now, most pastors, we love stories that wrap up all neat and tidy with a pretty little bow at the end. You know, it's like I gave Jesus my depression, and then I was healed. And so please hear me. I'll be very clear. Okay, you fast forward from over a decade ago when Jesus started to make sense. You fast forward from then until today. The million dollar question is, did Jesus heal me of my depression? The answer is no. Follow up question. Do I still feel aimless and lost and confused? Do I still feel hopeless? Again, the answer to that question is no. Why? 
because Jesus' grace has been sufficient for me. And it's blowing my mind, but I'm watching his power be made perfect in my weakness of all things. And some of you are going like, dude, I'm still I don't think you can be a pastor with depression. It's like, great, I don't work here. Come back next week. <laughs> someone, else, someone else teach you next week. <laughs> All I can tell you is that I think the story I have to share is the same story that Paul had to share. It's a story I'll tell until the day I die. My story is that I am still a mess, but I am a mess who is loved. I am a mess that Jesus is committed to fixing. I am a mess who's been forgiven. I'm a mess who's been redeemed. I'm a mess who's been named a son of God. Like the only story I have to share with you today is if Jesus could love and forgive a mess like me, I promise he can love and forgive a mess like you. Why? Because his grace is sufficient for you. And if you let him, it'll blow your mind. He will display perfect power through your mess. It's like many of us, we convinced ourselves we don't have a story to share because we're works in progress. It's like we're all works in progress. No one's done a lot of us, we convince ourselves, I don't have a story to tell because I'm, not, I'm certainly not the hero in my story. It's like, dude, join the club. I go read that book. Go read the Bible. There's one hero in that thing. His name is Jesus Christ. Every other person you come across is a train wreck. They just happen to be train wrecks who are loved by the hero. Basically, like many of us believe that we don't have a story to share because we still have a thorn in our side. And meanwhile, Jesus Christ is going, buddy, the thorn in your side is the story I'm daring to share, to share, dying to share with the world. Like this is where my power will be made perfect. You have a story worth telling. You really do. And so if I could plead like just one thing with you this morning, it would be for the sake of, of Jesus' power being made perfect, and for the sake of your king's glory, please get real, get honest, and get vulnerable. I challenge you and say, when you hide your thorn, you hide the perfection of Jesus' power in your life. I challenge you and say, when you bury your sin, I promise, it only festers and grows. And I challenge you and say, when you put a face on, or you put a mask on for Sunday morning, eventually, you, you don't know how to take it off again. And it will stifle your joy, and it will suffocate your freedom. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to call the fake version of yourself into his kingdom. He came to call the real you. The broken, messy, rough around the edges sinner. He came to call the real you into his kingdom. So get real. I'm about to pray, but before I do, I want to share a picture with you. All right? I, I think it's just a great metaphor for what Jesus does with our brokenness. Okay, so there's this art form called kintsugi. Kintsugi. I'm not like an art guy. I, I know this because there's a band I like called Death Cab for Cutie who had that was their album name and I was like, what's that about? It sounds like a cuss word. And then it turns out it's a cool art form. So uh, here's what Kintsugi is. Pretend that you have, let's imagine you've got like a very special dish. Like think of like grandma's, you know, china cabinet or whatever. Like this heirloom has been passed down from generation to generation. Let's say one day you do something stupid, you drop it and it shatters into a hundred pieces. Okay. Well, in Japan, rather than try to glue the thing back together so that it looks perfect again, or rather than cut your losses and just throw the thing away, you might repair it with the art form known as kintsugi. And kintsugi is a method where you mend broken pieces back together by using a lacquer that has gold or silver or platinum in it. Looks like that when it's done. This is super pretty, right? But not only does it, does it look cool, there's a whole philosophy behind the art form of kintsugi which goes like this. Rather than trying to hide the brokenness of an object, Kintsugi treats the repair as something that makes the object more beautiful now. And it makes it actually more valuable now because there's literal gold inside of it. So like basically Kintsugi is the art form that says instead of being ashamed of the brokenness, we are going to draw attention to and glorify the repair. And I think that's a rad metaphor for what Jesus does in our lives. It's like our, our relationship with Jesus, this is one where Jesus glorifies himself through our brokenness. 
are, is, it's one where you and I become more beautiful and we become more valuable to the world around us, not because we've never been broken, but because we are broken and Jesus Christ loves us anyway. That is the story that we have to share. Like G Jesus wants to show the entire world that he does not quit. How, he's, how is he going to share that good news with the world? He's going to share it through the fact that he has not quit on a mess like you and a mess like me. And so, Rocky, get, get real. Do not hide your thorns. The, the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. The humbling fact is he's going to bathe the world in his glory through you. Like his light is going to shine into the darkness of the world through the cracks in your brokenness. And so do not hide your story. Do not hide your brokenness. Do not hide your weakness and do not hide your thorns. Because if your friends and family could see that Jesus' grace has been sufficient for you, then maybe, just maybe, they'll start to wonder if he could be sufficient for them. All right, let's pray. God, we come to you rough around the edges. And we come to you messy. We come to you broken. Some of us are coming to you lost and hopeless. God, we're a mess. We're, we're train wrecks and we know it, but we still approach you with confidence. And we approach you with confidence because we believe that you sit on a throne of grace. So God, thank you for loving our mess. And thank you for loving our brokenness. God, would you please give us courage, the courage to face our own brokenness, to be honest about it. Like, would you help us with that? Because we, we want to be honest about our brokenness, but not so that we can feel shame. You nailed our shame to a cross. You buried it. You're, you never once asked us to dig it back up. So we need help trying to remember our brokenness, not so that we can feel shame, but so that we can stand in amazement in front of your grace. God, help us to figure that one out. God, for some of us, we need some, some courage to actually share our stories. Our stories are stories of our own brokenness, and that's always scary to talk about. So God, would you give us courage to share the story of your hope and your love in the midst of our brokenness, to share that with our friends and our family and our coworkers? And then God, for anyone who's here and they're just kind of checking this Jesus stuff out and they're checking you out because their lives are a mess right now and they're just kind of curious as, as to whether or not you could help, could you please do what a sermon cannot do and a worship song cannot do, only your spirit can do it. Could you please speak deeply into that person's heart? Would you blow them away with your steadfast love? And would you blow that person away with the fact that you have not quit on them and you know them by name and you've been waiting for this moment? God, thank you for who you are. We tend to forget all the time. This is why we're here. We just need reminded. But we thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for your amazing grace that saved wretches like us. And it's in the name of your holy son, Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen. Appreciate that word from Ben, just a reminder, we're all a mess. We have a mess, messy story, but God loves you. He wants to use your story, so take that with you this week. A couple things before we get out of here. Ladies in the room, we have a Be Known event coming up. There's a sign out in the lobby, has a QR code. Go sign up for that. The deadline for that's next week. It's going to be a ton of fun. And you heard Matt say we're kicking off a new series next week. What can we learn from donkeys and elephants? Figure that out if you will between next week and this week. It's going to be awesome. Have an amazing week. Love you guys. See you next Sunday.